we learned a lot about probabilities. Now, we're going to switch it up with samples and their populations with your instructor, Dr. Todd Dang. Well, hello, welcome. We've made it to week 11, and this week we're talking about samples and populations. Now, you remember the last two weeks we focused a lot on probabilities, and it might seem like a sudden shift that now we're talking about samples and populations. Why does this topic come right after we've spent so much time talking about probability? And the answer to that is going to become clear in future lectures, because here's where we're going to end up. We're going to wind up with hypothesis testing, in which we test a hypothesis about the probability that a given sample is drawn from a population. We're going to combine all of these ideas of samples and populations and probabilities. That's why we're covering this topic next. So let's start with an idea about populations and samples. You have a, a heart that beats within your chest. It's beating all of the time. We know that there are ranges in which the number of heartbeats per minute typically fall. There are levels that when the heartbeat gets too high, we know that's unhealthy. But if I were to ask you, how many times does your heart beat per minute, how could we measure that? Now, the simplest way would be to find your pulse and then count for 60 seconds the number of times that your heart beats. How else could we arrive at that answer? Well, instead of counting for a full 60 seconds, what we could do is maybe count for 10 seconds. We count the number of heartbeats over 10 seconds, and then we multiply that by 6. What we do is we take a subset of our, sample, of our population, the number of heartbeats per minute, and we use that smaller value to tell us something about the larger value, that sample to tell us something about the population. If I ask you how many times your heart beats in an hour, how can we measure that? One thing we could do is take that figure that we got from our measuring for 10 seconds, and we can multiply that by the appropriate number, and we could get a number of heartbeats per hour. But would you be okay with using a little 10 second sample to say how many times your heart beats in an hour? There's going to be a couple of problems with that. Are you measuring at the right time? If you're measuring when you're quiet, your heart rate might be lower than it might be when you're a little more active. And also, there's this little problem called measurement error. And that occurs when you measure for 10 seconds and you're off by one heartbeat. Well, if we're multiplying by six to get the number of heartbeats per minute, the most you could be off with one heartbeat of measurement error would be six beats per minute. But if we multiply that times an hour, now you could be off dramatically. We want to be sure that when we are measuring samples, that we're measuring accurately, we want to minimize sampling error. And we're going to talk about ways that we do that as we get a little further along in the lecture. What would it mean to have a good sample. We have a population, there is a population, and we have a research question about that population. We want to know the average height, or weight, or IQ, or shoe size, or personality measurement. We sample a subset of that population, a smaller group that comes from that population, in order to answer our research question. Now, if our sample is representative, if it looks like the population, then the characteristics of the sample will apply, in general, to the population. It doesn't happen all the time. It's possible that we could have a non-representative sample, which would occur if we have sampling error. And what we will do then is take what we learned about our sample and apply it to the population. We will estimate the characteristics of the population based on what we learn from the sample. So it's important that we have our definitions straight. Let's start with a few definitions. I'm going to begin with population. 
A population is the entire collection of units that the researcher studies. And by unit, I mean an element of the population. Uh, it could be people, if we're studying people. Uh, it could be historical cases, if we're doing archival research. It could be uh, ficus trees, or it could be dogs, depending upon the research that we're doing. The population is the entire collection. The sample is a subset of units that are drawn from that population. Depending on the research we're doing, we may call our participants subjects. If they are human beings, we call our subjects participants. So participants are the subjects in the sample, or subjects are the participants in the sample. And a frame is a list of all of the elements that may be sampled within our population. If our sample has the same characteristics as our population, we will say it is a representative sample. If the sample is representative, then what we learn about the sample applies in general to the population. We would say it generalizes. It doesn't mean that everything is exactly the same as the population. It means that in general, what is true of the sample is true of the population. Sampling error is what occurs when the samples are either not random or not representative. What do I mean by a random sample? Well, the, the cleanest definition of a random sample is this. A sample is random when every member of the population has an equal chance of being selected. Random sampling is the best way to get a representative sample. But we have to keep in mind that just because a sample is random doesn't guarantee that it will be representative. The best way to get there, the best way to get a representative sample is to use random sampling. But even though we do our best practices and use great random sampling techniques, it is possible that just by luck of the draw, just by a random chance, we will get a sample that is non-representative of the population. We also want to talk about replacement or not when it comes to sampling. If we sample with replacement, what we are doing is we're putting the elements that are selected back into the population before we choose the next element. What we are more familiar with is probability without replacement. This is where the previously selected items are not replaced into the, into the sample, into the population rather, before we choose the next element. Let's take an example of this. You maybe participated in a raffle where you buy a ticket, in fact, you buy two tickets, and one of your tickets goes into the hopper and the other one you keep with you, and at some point toward the end of the event, we spin that big drum around and someone pulls a ticket, supposedly at random, from that bin. They reach in, pull out a ticket, read the number, and then they set that number aside. They don't put it back into the population. In other words, if you've won one time, your chance of winning a second time has now dropped to zero because you're no longer in the population that is being sampled. So would this be sampling with replacement or without? Because we are not putting the ticket back into the population, this would be sampling without replacement. So let me summarize sampling for you. And we can summarize it this way. You are cooking a stew. You have this kettle of stew on your kitchen range top, and you want to know, is the stew ready? Are the potatoes fully cooked? Are the carrots not too firm, but not too mushy? Is there enough salt? Does it need more seasoning? How could you determine whether or not this kettle of soup is ready to serve? Do you have to eat the whole thing to know that answer? No. We could take a smaller sample. We could take a, a bowl full of stew. But do you have to even eat that much? You could tell. Are the potatoes cooked? Are the carrots cooked? You could answer that question with only one spoonful of the stew. But what has to be true about that spoonful? It has to be representative of the stew. How would we make sure that the spoonful that we get at random 
is representative of the stew, we would start by stirring it up. We stir it up really well. What are we doing? Randomizing. We want every part of that stew to be just like every other part of that stew. We don't want to specifically choose one potato that looks good. We want it to be thoroughly randomized so that when we choose a random sample, our random sample tells us something useful about the population. Results from the sample, from our spoonful, should generalize to the population. What I learned from my spoonful is true in general of the population, the kettle of stew. A sample is generalizing better when it's more representative, and the best way to get a representative sample is to use a random sample. And that's what we need to know about sampling, random sampling, and representative samples.